guys, how's it going? Merry Christmas to everybody. This is going to be our Christmas Live. I know it's been a while since I've done a Christmas Live, so um, I thought I'd get one going for you guys. So hopefully it goes well. Now, I know a lot of you guys are sitting at home because it is Christmas Day, so hopefully we get a decent turnout. And if not, it doesn't particularly matter. I'm going to leave it up. So I hope you all have had a good Christmas so far. I know I have. How's it going, everybody? I see you all in the chat. And um, today, I wanted to take a moment to talk a little, a little bit about... <laughs> Wait, technical difficulties? What, it's not working? Hasn't technical difficulties go hand in hand? You know, one day I'm going to hire someone and their only job is going to be to make sure that there are no technical difficulties. But that day is not today. So unfortunately, I'm my own tech support. Can you guys see me okay? Just comment in the chat. If you guys can see me okay, I'll get started. If you guys can hear me okay, I'll get started. If not, let me know. More at this time. Well, the reason I don't normally do this... Well, I mean, it is, it's 2 p.m. on a Sunday, so normally I'm training dogs. Um, normally I'm training dogs, and, and that's the... Uh, that's the reason why you don't normally find me uh, at 2 p.m. On a, on a Sunday. Okay, good. Everybody can hear me. All right. Okay, guys. So I'm gonna get I'm gonna get started. Uh, you guys might hear some kids in the background screaming and running around, but it's Christmas, so you know the kids are all home, and that's what what it's gonna be. Now I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit. I like to have a generally have a topic for my lives. My topic today is gonna be relationship. Now I actually shot a uh, 20 minute YouTube video. Um, you know, I had my apprentice, Omer, um, who I'll probably introduce to you guys soon. I know he, he might even watch this. Omer, you're a cool guy. Anyways, Omer was uh, holding the camera for me for 22 minutes. And I did this whole video while training my dog simultaneously on relationships and how to build a relationship with your dog. Because I feel like it's a term that like many other generic terms these days um, overused very overused and used incorrectly so I wanted to talk to you guys about relationship with dogs because I've had I'm, I'm I'm different than a lot of people because a lot of people you know you, you have one dog and, and you keep it and then you know 10 12 years it passes on and then you get another one so on and so forth because of my profession I've had many dogs and I've had many dogs for various periods of time and I've had many different types of dogs so I've really had the opportunity to run the gauntlet of relationships when it comes to dogs to see it to see it over the short term over the long term um, you know to see it how it actually plays out in the context of training so on and so forth so um, I, I think I'm I'm uniquely qualified to speak about relationships in a way that most people that speak about them probably aren't um, so let's talk about relationship. Now, relationship is a term that you tend to hear more in the force-free, positive-only dog training space. And uh, usually you'll see it online or you'll see it, you know, somebody, you know, having a podcast or something. They'll say, you know, I would never do that to my dog I pref because I want to focus on my relationship. I would never correct my dog. I would never put an e-collar on my dog. I would never do X, Y, or Z to my dog because of relationship. And they say that and they just kind of just rolls off the tongue and every, I, I see that nobody ever questions them on it. Nobody, nobody ever pulls them up short and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Quantify exactly what you mean by relationship. Because your implication is that doing what you do provides a superior relationship as opposed to what exactly, right? Like as opposed to what? So I always say with that stuff, you know, it's like, again, Attempts to seize the moral high ground. No great surprise coming from that ideology in dog training, right? That's basically all it is from top to bottom. But let's quantify what a relationship is. What is a healthy relationship, um, period? Like we don't even have to say dog-human. We could just say human-human. 
what what are the components of that relationship? Because if you were to believe the positive only ideologues, the force free ideology, you bribe your way into that relationship. You never do anything. You never create any aversive situations for the dog. You never uh, cause any aversives to occur to the dog. Everything is positive. Everything is giving always from you to the dog. So basically it's a bribery, right? Constant, a constant state of bribery. You ignore or avoid the bad behaviors um, and you just, you know, cookies and hope underneath all the science, all the scientific lingo they like to use to, to confuse the common man, so to speak. It, it comes down to cookies and hope. And if I only give him cookies and I only hope he's going to love me. And it's a weird thing because that that's not how relationship works work even for humans. I think the, the best comparison you can make between a human-dog relationship and a human-human relationship, I, I feel like it's children. And I have children, so I can I can make that comparison because I find it's awfully similar, um, you know. And again, depending on the length of your relationship, long term relationship with a dog, very similar to a child, um, you know. Maybe short term relationship, more like you know drill sergeant, depending on the dog, depending on the situation, um, you know. And and cons, con, uh, contrary to popular belief, a drill sar I was in the military for a short period of time. A drill sergeant, right, or, or platoon sergeant or, or, or leadership of, of a small section of, uh, of, of men in the military, it's almost like a fatherly relationship. He's the disciplinarian, but he also gives you good things and he guides you through this process of becoming a soldier, becoming something that's useful to the military um, complex that you're a member of in whatever role that you're a member in. He trains you how to do your job. You know, he praises you and gives you positive things when you're good and he punishes you when you're bad, right? So it's, it's almost like a, a, a kind of a pseudo father figure. It's not just like this, you know, one-sided abusive relationship that maybe social media likes to make it out to be or, or, or entertainment likes to make it out to be. So for sure, like when I have a more short-term relationship with a dog, it can be that type of relationship as well. Anyways, um, those relationships are not completely based on bribery. Right? Like I don't, I have kids. I don't bribe my kids into listening to me. They know that if they don't listen to me, there's consequences. They also know that, you know, if they do what I ask them to do and, you know, they're generally good human beings, they're going to get nice things. And on the flip side, if they don't, there are consequences to their actions. But I'm consistent and I'm reliable, right? Now, the problem, I think where discipline gets a bad name, I mean, with when it comes to human beings... We tend to vilify discipline even when it comes to children these days. I mean, you just, I have kids in the school system, so I see it firsthand, right? No discipline. Oh, uh, and they'll always say it's scientifically proven. I'm like, I don't know what science you ever read that implied that not giving kids due dates, not holding them accountable for not doing a good job in their schoolwork was a good thing, right? Because it certainly isn't. Like the quality of education over the last two decades has plummeted precipitously you know my I got a couple kids in high school right now and um, when I compare the work because I see their homework when I compare the work they're doing now to the work that they were doing in the past there's no there's no comparison anyways I'm kind of getting a little sidetracked let's focus on the dogs so a good relationship has multiple components but the biggest component that a relationship has is trust okay and trust doesn't come from bribery. I mean, he could trust that I'm always going to give him nice things, but that's not where true trust comes from because that implies that the dog doesn't require any guidance from you. All he requires is nice things from you. All he requires is reinforcement, positive reinforcement from you, but that's not true at all, right? In many cases, you're dealing with dogs that need a lot more than just positive reinforcement. You're dealing with dogs that need guidance through dealing with fear, anxiety, aggression, right? These dogs, like I said, the best, for me, the best um, relationship comparison is, 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 you know, father, child, or mother, child, right? Like my children don't need me to just be their friend. They need me to guide them through life. They need me to show them when they're wrong. They need me to show them how to do things because they don't know how to exist in this world yet. That's part of growing up and becoming uh, a, a an adult is learning how to 
manage everything from social relationships to financial relationships to, you know, crossing the road, driving their car. Dogs are no different. Obviously, they're not going to become human adults. But when you get a puppy or a young dog or even an older dog that doesn't, hasn't been taught how to live in our world, because make no mistake, these animals live in our world. We don't live in their world. We need to show them how to exist in our world, especially the, 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 the modern world. Back in the day, look, people would leave the dog in the backyard. He'd be tied to his doghouse. You know, they'd turn him loose to run in the neighborhood. No word of a lie. They would do that. They didn't care. It's a dog. Now dogs have transcended that for the most part. Now dogs are members of our family. So it's so much more important to provide that guidance because now the dog's in the damn house. The dog's in your bedroom. The dog's with your kids. You've got to walk the dogs among your neighbors, right? Like you got to take the dog for a walk and there's your neighbor passing you by. There's the kids, you know, going to school. There's, there's the neighbor's dog. There's the cat. There's whatever. Like there's a lot more now because we need a lot more out of these dogs. Things that aren't necessarily natural to them. It's not natural for your dog to not pull you on a leash. Your dog should, your dog's dog generally is going to want to naturally pull you on a leash. Your dog's not going to always want to come when he's called. Your dog's not going to want to hold a downstay or, you know, hold a place in the house. You're not, your dog's going to not, your dog's not going to naturally not want to crap in your house. That These things that we need from our dogs in order to coexist with them peacefully, it's in many cases not natural for the dog. We're asking them to behave in an artificial manner that's not natural for them. So in order for us to be able to guide them through this process of basically becoming a, a dog that is a member of the family, you need to be ready to provide them with guidance. And guidance doesn't just involve bribery. It doesn't just involve giving them nice things. It also involves correcting the bad things, right? And when you're consistent with that, you're able to provide the dog with, with the type of, um, you know, with, you're able to provide the dog with that trust in you because he trusts me. He knows I'm going to hold him accountable for the bad and I'm going to reward him for the good. He doesn't need to worry when he's out with me, right? So this is an example, right? This is my dog, Gage. Some of you have probably seen this video and I wanted to show, right? This is my dog and my relationship. I have not um, been more harsh on any dog um, over this dog. And what I mean by that is, you know, people might think, oh, you know, this dog is your personal dog. So you kind of favor him or there is no dog I have trained that I haven't put more pressure on than Gage, right? Like Gage is a, is a very independent nature dog. Um, you know, he's a dog that, that has a lot of uh, predisposition. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Like I've said before many times, he's a reactive dog. Um, he's an aggressive dog. Like he will, you know, he would be reactive towards other dogs and, and, and reactive towards people if I allowed him. He's also a really high drive dog, right? He loves to self-satisfy constantly. He's a, he's a big dog for self-satisfaction. He's not a particularly pliant or, or bit naturally biddable dog. These behaviors you see from him are the product of, of, of a lot of hard work and a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, training, a lot of training to make him like this, right? But the dog loves me. And anybody who watches the dog work with me, I have disciplined this dog every single way. And I will continue to discipline this dog. I make no bones about it, right? I've used e-collar, pinch collar, choke collar. I've used my hands with this dog, right? He's a dog that, like I said, he takes... He takes a lot of the stick just as much as he takes the carrot. But look how he works for me. Like very few of these people that talk about relationships have ever had a dog work for them the way my dog works for me. And he's not an isolated case. I have other dogs. I have a, another dog right now that I'm working with, Yaxi. Um, and he's he's uh, actually going to be better than Gage in my opinion. But he's a more uh, compliant, like he's naturally a little bit more compliant than Gage is, a little more social, you know. Uh, a, 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 an easier dog. But look at this dog. Like I've, you've got other dogs molesting him. And it's funny. I set this room up on that day. I said, all right, guys, you know what? I train like this every day with the dog. Um, you know, there's constantly people around. Any dog I train, there's this whole kind of scene going on where we have all these people and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you this. Um, 
I said, you know what, let me put this on video because I guess it's not normal. You know, I guess people don't often train like this. Like my dog is literally so intent on working with me and so focused on me that there can literally be another dog that jumps on him and he will maintain his focus on me and the task at hand. And this was him when he was young. I think he was like a year old in this video. Um, or maybe it was like 14 months. It's hard to remember exactly, but he wasn't an older dog here, right? So this is an example, right? Like I like to show, I don't like to just talk. Now, that's me kind of doing more trick type training with the dog. Now, and you guys have seen constant videos of this, right? So this is me with the dogs when they were, I don't know, maybe like 14 months, 15 months old. It wasn't long after that actually. And, and this is how I walk these dogs, you know, like in public, right? Like you guys have seen me do it, but again, I have to show the video because you never know, right? Who's going to be around. Uh, you never know who's watching and, and maybe they don't believe me when I say these things, but like these are young dogs. They're about the same age, about 14, 15 months old in this video. And this is how we walk everywhere, Right. Now, you can see they're both wearing e-collars, which, of course, I have used in the training process. Look at the relationship I have with those dogs. Look how willing and compliant they are. How can this be? The positive only force-free trainer would have you believe that um, these dogs only uh, work with me because they're afraid of me. They're in constant fear of, of, of pain and abuse, right? Like, that's why they listen to me. But no, they listen to me because, yeah, I make it good to be good, but I also give them freedom, right? Like look how much freedom my dogs have. When you compare that to your average, you know, force-free trainer or, or whatever else, like can they can they quantify their relationship? Because my relationship, I've shown you what my relationship equals, right? My relationship equals the, uh, the, uh, the fantastic obedience that you just saw um, with, with my dog Gage. And again, I've demonstrated that with multiple dogs, right? This is what my relationship equals. I'm quantifying my relationship right now. That's what I'm doing, right? That's my relationship. And this is what also my relationship equals, right? Is, is my dog's off leash in a, in a very public area. For those of you that haven't been here, this is Banff, Alberta. And uh, let me see if I can find some other stuff here. And this is what my relationship equals. And that's just with my two current dogs. Now, Here's the other thing. I wanted to. I don't like to just show my dogs because people can claim whatever they want about my dogs. I'm not a positive only trainer that only just has his like border collie or his Malinois. And, oh, look at my look at my fantastic training. I can train this super compliant, biddable dog. Even though I'm telling you guys, Gage is not that dog. This is a member of our online course. Um, this is Ian. Man, I'm trying to remember Ian's last name. He's in the UK. Okay, so he's got like four of these. Malamute Huskies, I think they are. Sorry, Ian, if I'm wrong. Um, and Ian's a dog trainer too, but he took our online course and he's using a, he uses e-collars with his training. His dogs are off leash. Like look at Ian go, right? Like he is killing it. Um, and is it Ian? No, it's not Ian Welch. Man, I'm sorry, Ian. I, your last name like completely slipped my mind. Anyways, he's in the UK, guys. If you ever see it, I think he, he offers training too. So, you know, by all means, hit him up. Look at those dogs. That's his relationship with those dogs. Can any positive or force-free trainer walk four sled dogs, walk four dogs of that breed loose off leash next to a busy road? Can they pass by people? Can they deal with, uh, you know, whatever it is you're going to deal with on the road, all the distractions? Obviously, Ian can. And he's got multiple videos in our uh, Facebook group, by the way. We have a Facebook group for all the people that are in our um, Elite Off-Leash course. And, uh, you know, Ian's always posting videos. He's into the wolf dogs, too. So he's got, like, wolf dogs he's doing off-leash obedience with. He's got these huskies. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Like, look at the dogs. Look at the behavior they have with them. They're, they're, they're having a good time. They're free, but they're also listening to them. You know, I always ask the force-free trainers. I say, why, you know, okay, you've got, you've got such a fantastic relationship. You, you, you choose to uh, focus on your relationship with your dog. Why then do you need a leash? You've got such a fantastic relationship. Why are you restraining your dog with a leash? Surely your dog's going to stay with you because he or she loves you. Surely your dog can walk next to a busy highway and stay off that highway because the relationship you have is so superior to mine, right? That you should be at least able to match what I'm doing, but you can't. 
And we both know you can. If you could make videos like this, and listen, I've got videos, you guys watch my videos, whatever else. And there's a lot of other trainers online that have videos, you know, of, of varying levels of quality, but a lot of them with off-leash training, they're all balanced trainers. You don't see force-free, positive-only trainers doing off-leash work in public. You'll see them doing it in an empty field or in their training room. You don't see them doing it in a busy area that has tons of variables, right? Or if they're doing it, it's like two minutes and they're luring the dog with like a piece of food or a ball and he's dragging a leash. You, I just chill with my dogs, right? I can do the trick obedience and all that stuff. This is me. I just walk like this. I'm just chilling. I'm not luring them. I'm not bribing them. You know, it's like, hey, man, like this is what I expect you to do. And the, the relationship I have with them is that I can take these two dogs, both of which ironically are reactive, and I can walk them like that anywhere. And I, I'm not concerned about it, right? Whereas you with your fantastic relationship can't do this. So whose relationship is really better, I ask you? Now... Again, these are my dogs. Let me go back. Oh, by the way, this is fantastic. Look at this. Like, people just squeezing by us, and my dogs are just on my leg. Now, it's funny, because, like, um, what was it? This was the same place. I like showing the same work, like, years, um, years, I think it was, like, what, five years ago. Same place, right? And this is me with my first pair of uh, Malinois, all right? Look at that. There's a squirrel. I got two Malinois right there on the trail. Okay. High drive Malinois. These are, these were dogs that I did sport with. That was Bastion and Nova, right? Now I have that relationship with my dogs that I can walk them in that type of environment without being worried. They're going to run off. They're going to attack somebody or anything else like that. Right? So that's, let me see here if I can. You know, that's how I walk my dogs. Again, could I use like a cookie and like bribe them and lure them? Sure. But there's no longevity in that. This is how I walk my dogs. This is, and this is the freedom that they got to enjoy. And that's my whole point with this stuff is they say the word relationship and no one ever holds them accountable. I've quantified my relationship with my dogs. I've shown multiple dogs. And then I've also shown someone who's just, you know, training um, in our training system that I that I online, I didn't even talk to this person and I didn't even train this person in, in person. They just took our training system online and they're able to do that. And by the way, there's many videos of people in our training system, just the online people. I'm not even talking about the in-person people that have those same results. Dog walks next to you. Dog sits when he's told to sit. He comes when he's told to come. He's calm. He's relaxed. Right. And then also have the adrenalized training. Cause I know what the, uh, I know what the positive only trainers are going to say. They're going to say, oh, in that video, your dog pinned his ears back and that dog's tail was slightly um, lowered and this is an indication of stress and blah, 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 blah. Listen, I've got the tricky stuff. I've got, I've got you know, videos of my dogs trialing, right? I've got this. You want to talk about body language? Let's watch. And this is not the only video I have. This is just the video I have queued up right now. You want to talk about body language? Let's talk about body language, all right? Look at my dog. That's me training him. That's me actually correcting him in session. That's his body language. So, so cut the nonsense. You guys don't have uh, a, a monopoly on relationship. In fact, I would argue that my relationship with my dogs and people that train like me, we have a superior relationship. And the, the reason why is it's not bribery. I'll tell you this. I've, I get a lot of dogs in for training. And a lot of them come from a trainer who's only done the positive only stuff and the owners have finally had enough. They finally want, they, they, they decide they need a dog that listens or they need the dog to stop doing X, Y, or Z. You know, hey, we need them to stop going after other dogs on the walk. So, you know, we finally decided to send them to Big Bad Shield Canine. And the first thing I do with that dog is I get more engagement from that dog than any positive trainer in their most fevered dreams could ever get from that dog. And I do that in about 20 minutes, simply by following my loose leash regimen. Within 20 minutes, that dog under distraction is constantly checking in with me and starting to open up. If I get a fearful dog, right? A lot of people, for some reason, there's, I see a lot of online chatter that um, people think we only deal with the big, tough 
you know, crazy dogs. You know how many fearful dogs that we get coming in here crawling on their belly? And people think, oh, that's the dog for positive training. No, that is not the dog for positive training. Let me see if I can find some videos of a fearful dog. So um, I think I did one called Don't Buy Puppies Like This. All right. Don't buy puppies like this. All right. Do, 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 do. Okay, so I'm not going to play the audio from this. I just want to show what the dog looked like when we started. Okay, this is when we started the training. Super avoidant, really fearful dog. Um, you know, very low body language, uh, very socially insecure. You know, this was when she was first dropped off, kind of what she was like. And I did a video. <laughs> I did a video like this. I did a video on this puppy just because I was frustrated with the state of German Shepherd breeding. I know the parent, the reason why this puppy had this level of genetic fear was because it was, it was a bad breeding. You know, a lot of people are like, what happened to her? Nothing happened to her. She was purchased as a very small puppy by people that really loved and cared about her and chose to spend the appropriate amount of time and effort on her training. And, um, you know, they just didn't know what to do. And they ended up with this avoidant, terrified dog. And by the way, I trained her brother um, shortly after uh, we finished with her because her mommy and daddy were so happy. I guess they told the litter mates. Um, and it was the same. You know, the brother wasn't as bad, but he was still pretty bad. You know, the second you would hold your hand out to this dog, I, know she, I think I'm just talking here. She would go into full avoidance and tail down and so on and so forth. So anyways... This was what happened after a little bit of training, okay? This is where, and you notice that I show the change in the dog's behavior in public. So what are we using? We're using the e-collar. We're using structured play, right? And it's not just, you can't just take an e-collar and put it on this dog and start zapping and think it's going to get better. But what these dogs really respond to is tactile learning, right? Learning that involves touching and guiding, negative reinforcement. Contrary to popular belief, you do not bribe a fearful, terrified dog out of being fearful and terrified. You can't do that. Now, structured play surely does help, but there needs to be an element of, I know you're scared, but you have to. I know you're scared, but you have to. And when you do that a bunch of times with these dogs, you wouldn't believe how much they start believing in, in themselves. They lack the ability to kind of push themselves through that fear. So when you start pushing them through that fear, flooding, I know, oh, it's flooding. Yeah, that is the best thing you can do for these dogs. But you do it in a smart way, right? So now we show the same dog. Um, what was it? This was her in uh, Walmart first time. So we took her off the property now and she's in Walmart and this is a young puppy and you know, you can see she's all like, holy crap, she's looking around and we're starting to use that tactile reinforcement. Hey, pay attention. We're walking. Pay attention to the job. Don't worry. Yeah, I know that guy with the carts is scary. I know those noises are scary. You got to do it, right? And you do that in a in an ethical and, and humane way. You know, it's not about lighting the dog up and being cruel to her. It's about guiding her firmly and without any kind of emotional nonsense through life. This is how you deal with people. It's okay. You can look at the people. They're not going to kill you. You know, oh, I know the door is scary. Just walk by it. And when you do well, we'll play a little bit, right? And this dog, if we had brought her the first day that she came here, she would have, you know, ejected her anal glands, right? You can see she's still nervous, but this is a little bit into the training now. She's able to do it. She's a little, oh, that was scary, right? She's able to do it. She's able, you can see it's not a complete um, shutdown now in the dog's behavior. The dog is able to kind of, you know, deal with it a little bit. There are still moments like, holy crap, those guys on the bikes, they might kill me, right? But it's not a complete, you know, shit show where the dog's just completely falling apart. She's able, with the tools that we've given her, now start to deal with the world. Now, I got to tell you guys, this is... How long ago was this? This was a while ago. And this was when she was a puppy. She, this is two years ago. This dog, I think, is like three years old now. And I've seen videos of her with the owners. I think you guys can follow her on Instagram. Her name is... Uh, <laughs> they really embrace the concept that she's fearful. Mishka the Fearful. 
right? So you follow her on Instagram. They're great people. I know they really look after the dog and they've done everything right with that dog. And she's really living a full life. I see her off leash. Can you imagine that dog being off leash if, if she had been left to her own devices? If she'd only been trained with bribery and relationship? You wouldn't have a dog. The dog would have run off, right? That dog would have lived a very limited and probably would have been reactive and all the other types of things that, you know, um, dogs like this end up being. Instead, we have a dog that is starting to learn how to come through life. And in the end, she was... Like I said, she became basically a fully functional dog. Does it mean that she didn't ever get scared? Of course not. She gets scared. But now we have the tools as handlers and the dog has the tools from her experience and being taught tactile cues how to overcome her fear. You don't get that with bribery. You don't. And, and this imaginary relationship. This dog had a much better relationship with my trainers and with her handlers because they they gave her guidance. They didn't leave her hanging out to dry by because they had some strange ideology that they were only gonna, you know, give her this force free training because they, they, they didn't want to stress her. You know what a force free trainer would do with this dog? They say, Oh, she's getting too stressed out. We need to stop. We need to keep her under threshold. This dog's entire life was lived over threshold. We need to show her how to deal with the damn threshold, not avoid it like the plague. Right? So yeah, I know you're scared. Let's get after it. Let's get after it. It's okay. You can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. And the dog's like, no, I can't. No, I can't. Oh, crap. I did it. And you know how much more confidence you give a dog like that when you show them that they can do it and that there's not an option to not do it? You wouldn't believe it. Let me see if I can find uh, another. There was a husky we did a while ago that I did catch. Most of these fearful dogs, you know, I don't get video of them, to be honest with you. I don't get video of most of them. More fun type of training that we do here. Or most of the, the things that we do. People tend to think our entire, you know, all the things that we do is is um, is shown online. Um, that is not true. Let me see here if I can find them. Uh, fearful. Yes, here we go. So this was a husky. One of the worst cases I've ever seen. Um, he came to us at like four months old. Um, terrified. Like, just terrified of everything. A terrible case. Um, and uh, Sal and I did the training with this dog. Sal did most of it. Sal's in Toronto, for those of you that are wondering. Um, so this is how he, he started with us. Like, this dog, you know, acted like the floor was made out of lava. Everything new for him was difficult, right? He was just very nervous, very flighty. This is four weeks in. Right? This is what this dog's able to do. And we did it in public with him. We did it everywhere with him. Fearful, insecure. Again, you can see the dog is afraid, but he doesn't know how to deal with that fear. Now the dog's off leash and it's a husky on top of that. Huskies can't be off leash. Well, this one sure as hell was. There's Cell, my brother, in case you guys are wondering. Right? And you can see he's able to deal with everything. You know, he didn't like putting his paws on things. We really showed him how to do that. Again, the difference between a fearful dog and a secure dog is the fearful dog knows, uh, the, the fearful dog doesn't know how to deal with that insecurity. The insecurity paralyzes them completely, right? Versus a, a, a more secure or confident dog, even when they get insecure, they have the tools mentally, maybe from, from a natural standpoint, to deal, with, um, to deal with that, right? So let me see if I can go back here and find something else here. I'll bring up another one because this is kind of showing something a little different. Now this, this dog, this video, I know this video. This is a very old video, by the way. This video was, um, I don't even know when this was. This was a while ago. This video has elicited some controversy. Oh, shoot. Okay, let's see if I can. All right. So this video elicited some controversy. And I'll tell you why this video listed some controversy. So this is Blake. <laughs> now, Blake was a male. Let me see if I can just pull this normally up. Blake was a male husky that we got in. And Blake was, so this was five years ago. Man, time flies. So anyways, obviously, our training has improved significantly in the last five years. My training improves every year, to be honest with you. I'm always doing different things and, and adding and taking away things from my training system. I'm always looking to optimize it. But that being said, Blake, we did a fantastic job with Blake, but people looked at him and 
you know, this was after a few weeks of training. We made a video. Yes, that was Blakey boy. Blake uh, bit his handlers multiple times. He was, there was no better way to describe Blake as, you're not going to bribe your way into Blake. Because as long as he wants to do what you want him to do, he would be good. But the second you said to Blake, hey man, I know you don't want to do this, but we got to do it anyways. That's when Blake would get real nasty. So he wasn't just non-compliant. Uh, Blake would become actively dangerous. He was a resource guarder. He was a lot of different things. Um, and he was a real, like, asshole of a husky. Like, he would he would come up the leash. And, and not because we were abused. He would come up for not very much reasons at all. Oh, there's a piece of food on the ground. I want it. And you're standing here. Screw you. Up the leash you'd come. Right? And then, God forbid, you actually wanted to train him to do something. This is one of the tricks with Huskies. You know, a lot of people, you know, we went through a period of time where we were dealing with a lot of really rough cases when it came to Huskies. Um, and Blake was like actually one of the first ones um, that we dealt with that was really bad. Um, and what it is with Huskies is they tend to really have a lot of problems with any kind of pressure. So they'll take your food all day. But listen, the second everybody knows you can't off-leash train a Husky because the second you turn a Husky loose and he has the choice between your hot dogs and... Uh, going wandering for a few days he's picking the wandering he's going he's gone right like he doesn't care they're not bred to be overly compliant or biddable dogs and because of the way they're bred they're bred to basically be independent to pull to go they actually generally have a lot of problems with pressure so when you put pressure on them they tend to overreact a lot right and oftentimes their reaction is an aggressive reaction right it's not an avoidant reaction it is actually an all-out aggressive reaction where they'll they'll try to um, you know nail you as a handler and, and Blake was no exception to that so this is after us putting some hard training on Blake right like you know we you could see here there's some suppression in the body language his tail always touched his back by the way and it wasn't just because he was a husky <laughs> it was because can you tell him to turn that volume off? I can't hear myself. Turn the songs off. Yeah. Kids. Um, so anyways, yeah, people are like, oh, look, look how, uh, he, he, look how suppressed he is and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, this is a dog you want a little suppressed. And after a while, by the way, he opened up. But this is four weeks of training. You can't really show the dog after like four months of training. But with this dog, I got no problems putting pressure on this dog. This dog needed some pressure. This dog, you can see there, as we start asking him to move a little more, he starts getting a little more amped up. But with repetitions of the obedience, you can see that the pressure starts to, to rise in the dog, but he knows, no options, man, you've got to do it. And I got no problems doing that with the dog too, because I see the long-term picture, right? My job is to give the handler something that they can actually live with and, and do. And, and this is the type of dog he needs to have a little more pressure in his life because that's what keeps him safe and sane, right? With some dogs, I know people want to pretend that dogs aren't like people in, in many ways. If you any if you're involved in any animal, dog, fish, horses, whatever, right? They snakes, they they all have different personalities. They all have different behavioral predispositions. Some are much more likely to bite you, others aren't, right? Blake, by the way, Blake liked attacking small dogs too. That was his little thing. You can see he gets a little roused there, but he does control himself. <laughs> he was just an asshat. So people are like, oh, look, that dog's a little afraid. Yeah, he is, as he should be. Some, just like, just like some human beings, you know, some human beings are assholes. The only way that they can work effectively with you is they have a little bit of a, a healthy fear. And that's part of the respect, right? So this concept that dogs... You know, if you train dogs with correction, you're going to ruin the relationship that you have with the dog. Even an asshat like Blake, absolutely not true. You're going to have the best relationship you could ever have with that dog, right? If you train with a balanced training system that makes sense. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to train all with pressure. Pressure is actually, I'll say this. So with positive reinforcement, generally speaking, if you don't know what you're doing, which most people that train with it don't. Um, you're not going to get anywhere and uh, you're going to have a dog who just kind of normalizes ignoring you. If you really do know what you're doing, you're going to have a dog who knows what to do 
but a dog that doesn't feel the need to always do it, especially under competing motivators. So if you see like the really good positive trainers, like the ones that are in the positive only camp, they're very smart with managing always everything. Everything's managed. The dog is on a line, which you could argue isn't particularly positive, right? The dog's on a leash or something like this. Why is he on a leash if everything's positive? If you want it to be positive, give him his freedom and let him pick what he wants to do. But regardless, everything's always very managed and they never put the dog in like kind of a lot of a situation where there's variable competing motivators that they haven't, you know, uh, they, they like to use the same environment over and over again. So you'll see the training room or the sport field that they always train on. That's what they'll do. They won't go in like public and just turn the dog loose and hope that the cookies work, right? So if you want to have a real functional relationship with your dog, there's multiple elements. Trust that comes from consistency. It comes from providing guidance. It comes from providing good consequences and bad consequences. If you don't provide bad consequences for bad behavior, how does the dog know a behavior is bad? Oh, you didn't give him his liver treat? That's how he knows the behavior isn't bad? Good luck with that. That's not how it works, right? Dogs generally engage in behaviors for one of two reasons. It's a learned behavior. So either you taught him or someone else taught him or something else taught him. He chased the squirrel, the squirrel ran away, and that was exciting, so he kept doing it, right? The squirrel taught him to chase to chase it, right? Um, he's afraid of dogs. And one day when he was young, a, a dog approached him, and he went, woo, 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 and the dog avoided him, right? Or the owner of that dog took that dog away. Okay, so he learned now to make a big show to drive the dogs that he's afraid of away. Now you have a leash-reactive dog, right? Nature the environment, and you are constantly teaching your dog whether you intend to or not. You're constantly reinforcing behaviors positively or negatively and also punishing behaviors positively or negatively, right? Your dog gets a little bit too too much in front of you. Maybe you're clumsy like me. You step on his paw one too many times. <laughs> that really, really hurts. He's going to stay out of your way, right? Like that's an example of positive reinforcement that you maybe, sorry, positive punishment that you didn't have an intention to commit upon the dog, but he did it. Now, if you're still a little bit questionable, I want you to think of all the times that you've accidentally um, caused an aversive situation to your dog, right? Stepping on the feet is usually the most common thing. You, you didn't see where you were going, you stepped on your... Did your dog hate you afterwards? No, your dog didn't hate you, right? Your dog might have been suppressed for a short period of time. Oh, he stepped on my foot, that really hurt. Oh, man. But then he bounced right back and he acted normal. The reason why is because it's pretty predictable. I stay out of his way. He doesn't step on my feet. He's not going to go and stay like 20 feet away from you because he knows that the contingency for getting his foot stepped on is getting in front of you, right? So it's it's all about clarity. With, with positive only training, like I was saying, the really good trainers, they, they can have a dog that knows how to do things, but they're not going to ever have a dog that's reliable in doing things. And I think that they really uh, fail constantly, the dogs that are actually fearful and insecure. The type of training I do and the type of training that, you know, I think really good balance trainers do, it, it brings the dog through the fear. It brings the dog through the anxiety and it gives the dog a framework from which to operate. I know the rules. Thank God someone explained the rules to me. The dogs not knowing the rules, I think that's a terrifying thing, right? Just like children. You know, the most infused children, the, the children that act out the most, in many cases, they're not receiving any guidance at home. Not always, but in many cases, they're not receiving any guidance at home, right? There's no one communicating effective. Listen, anybody that has kids in the public school system at this time, and by the way, I have some younger kids, they will not be going into the public school system simply for this. They have removed a lot of the guidance for these kids. They have removed the consequences, right? They've even removed a lot of the positive consequences because they don't want to make the kids that maybe didn't work as hard or weren't as, as good in the schoolwork feel like they're less. So they've removed a lot of the incentive structures that they had to incentivize uh, good behavior and, uh, you know, superior um, academic achievements. Um, and then they've also removed things that disincentivize bad behavior like failure, getting an F, getting held back, so on and so forth. So in much of the school systems in the Western world, we've moved to this much more kind of just this gray area where the good isn't overly incentivized and the bad isn't disincentivized. And we have a bunch of confused kids. Look at the mental health rate, the reported mental health rate for kids now. Look at all the behavioral problems these kids have. Look at the things these kids are saying right? 
It's because we've removed a framework from which they can operate. Look at how they treat their elders. Would kids 30 years ago treat their elders like that? In general, no. Of course not. It was unheard of. It's the same with dogs. They need a framework. They don't know what to do in many cases. And in, oftentimes they're doing the wrong thing. You must give them guidance. Relationship doesn't come from bribery. Relationship comes from taking a leadership role, saying, I'm going to give you the good, I'm going to give you the bad, I'm going to give you guidance, and I'm going to be consistent. And I will say this about consistency. The biggest mistake I see people, listen, positive-only trainers like to pretend like their movement's the new movement, and everybody's doing it, and it's science. Listen, positive training's been around for two decades. They've got nothing to show for it. If anything, what I see as a dog trainer that's on the ground is more and more and more people training with tools. They're training with pinch collars. They're training with e-collars because there's more and more trainers doing the training. Unfortunately, many of those trainers don't know what the hell they're doing. So I see people using these devices very ineffectively because for them, the training is the device. I've said this before. The, tra the device is an amplifier of your ability as a trainer and your understanding of how dogs think, learn, and communicate. If you don't know these things and you're using those devices... It's not good. You're not going to get anywhere more than the positive only trainer. And in many cases, you could even cause a little bit more stress on the dog and a little lack, uh, more lack of clarity, right? Especially if you're dealing with a more difficult case. Like many dogs are very user friendly in the training, but not everybody has a lab. Some of you have an asshole husky like Blake. Now, what are you going to do? You put that e-collar on him and, and you light him up and he's next to you. See what happens to you. You give him a bang on that prong collar. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to come up the line and he's going to come for you. You need to know what you're doing. Training with pressure is an art form. It is an art form. Very few people know how to do it. The people that are writing books generally don't know how to do it. The, the, the people with all the letters after them certainly don't know how to do it. And the science on it, unfortunately, because of uh, – they, they hide behind this thing. They say it's, eth it's unethical. We won't – what do you mean it's unethical? You know how many thousands or, or millions of prong callers are, are in the world that dog trainers are using and that uh, dog owners are using? You know how many gentle leaders and e-collars and like these these tools are being used. You need to study them properly and not the nonsense that they do. Like I'm going to say one more thing before I get to the, the comments. These days, and I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. People use the word science like they used to use the word God. And I'm a God-fearing man. I believe in God. But back in the day, listen, if they wanted you to do something, they would just say, well, God wills it so. God says and God may not have, you know, depending on the religion or whatever, God probably didn't say any such thing, but they're using God as like this kind of uh, weapon to prove their, their moral superiority and to remove any dis discussion, to shut down any discussion, to shut down the opposition. I'm right because God says I'm right. I'm the king because God willed me to be the king. You know, you must do this because God says, right? And again, guys, I'm a God-fearing man. I'm certainly not an atheist. Uh, humans are designed to believe in something and if you don't believe in something you will believe in something and we see the effect of that these days but point being they use science the same way that they used to use god well science says trust the science you don't even know most people that say that don't even know how science works right like they, they haven't even taken a, a basic level of psychology to understand like they didn't take a psychology course they don't know how science works they don't know how they do these studies there is a right way and a wrong way to do these studies there is strong science and there is weak science most of these studies that they're citing when you look at how they compiled the information an opinion poll or they'll say things like we used industry experts to study the e-collar training industry experts I know like most of the industry experts, none of them were involved in your study. I know the, the, the people making the e-collars, they weren't involved in your study. So who did you, who did you study? Well, did you go on Amazon and find the, the guy making the cheap $50 e-collars probably in like some, uh, you know, in, in China or something. And, and then you picked his industry expert, which I don't even know who that would be. They never show videos of the training. Surely you should be able in this day and age. You should be able to show videos. These were the dogs trained with the e-collar. These were the dogs trained with positive only reinforcement. In fact, I'll tell you this, guys. I've seen video of some of, um, there was a recent study they did in the UK and there was all kinds of nonsense with the study. And they claimed that they trained dogs with positive only training and they trained dogs with, with e-collars. And uh, they found that the dogs with the positive only training were not only more reliable, but um, uh, they were less stressed. And I saw a video of one of the positive only trained dogs the trainer was like forcing a gentle leader onto the dog. The dog's tail was so far up his ass you didn't see his tail. 
And that was a leaked video. I, it's not on YouTube. Somebody showed it to me, right? Um, don't trust this stuff, especially when it doesn't uh, quantify. Like if they really wanted to study, not that you should really need to study anything that's observable to the naked eye, right? I've shown you all my proof. I've shown you my relationship with my dogs. I've shown you what my dogs can do. And I'm certainly not alone. They would take the top trainers in the world, the top positive trainers and the top trainers, you know, whatever, Ivan Balabanov, Bart Bellon, whatever, those big name guys. They would take them and they'd stack them up against whatever the positive only trainers are. I don't know, Zach George or some chick that does agility or whatever. And then they would they would say, okay, here's what we need you to do. We need you to train a recall. We need you to train this. We need you to train that. And they would make sure that the test involved competing motivators. Competing motivators are things that the dog wants to do instead of obedience. So when you're training in an empty room, there's no really, there's not real competing motivators. When you're training in an area that you've trained a lot before and you've physically prevented the dog from accessing competing motivators with a leash or something, you're not really in a situation with competing motivators. When you go out, this is why you'll never see the positive trainers do what I'm describing. You go out in public, there's people, there's squirrels, there's dogs. Not an empty field, public, urban area. Lots of things going on. Take the dogs off leash, give them free choice and see what happens, right? They will never do that test and they will never show that test because they know what the results are going to be. Listen, um, in this video in the description, I am going to post a study because they also tend to ignore the studies that prove the exact opposite of what they claim. Um, in 2008 in Germany, they did a study where they compared 42 police dogs in two different provinces. And these dogs were all um, trained by like the, the same consistent trainers. Um, they did uh, some of the dogs positive only with the food. I guess they used the leash, so it's not only positive only, but they had to prevent the dogs from, from doing the wrong thing somehow, right? But they trained the dogs, the, the, the exercise was very simple. They were all police dogs. The so police dogs all had drive. They all want to go and bite uh, the, the the bad guy, especially if he's wearing equipment that they know they can bite. So the the the, the test was they basically had to the handler had to walk by a decoy that was agitating the dogs and encouraging the dogs to come bite him. And I think he was wearing a sleeve. And the dogs the the, the handler that could call his dog off the decoy before the decoy got bit, um, they would consider that I think a success, right? So. They trained some of the dogs positive only with two, with food and with toys and with a leash, just on a flat collar. They trained some of the dogs with a pinch collar and then they trained some of the dogs with the e-collar. I don't know if they gave the pinch collar and the e-collar dogs positive reinforcement. Um, I'm under the impression after reading the study that they did not, but I wasn't clear on that. Regardless, they found that almost all the positive reinforcement, in fact, I think all of them failed. Not one of them succeeded in achieving that result of leaving the, the the decoy and coming to the handler even though again they practiced a lot they did the positive reinforcement it just didn't work right the, the pinch collar dogs were um less successful than the e-collar dogs but certainly a lot more successful than the um the the food train dogs and the, the toy train dogs right? But they showed stress. They showed more stress. And the reason why they showed more stress is because the contingency of the corrections is when you're using a pinch collar, guys, it's good for some things. But if you're doing distance work, generally the contingency of your corrections is, is delayed and it's more manual and it's more harsh. So it can cause more stress. So it's no surprise. And the dogs with the e-collar had the highest level of reliability and the lowest levels of stress. There you have it. And that video, that I'll post a link to that study. You can read it. Right. And this study followed rigorously all the with the control group and all the rules of science that follow. But you, you will never see them talk about that study. They're talking about some study conducted in the in the dark somewhere. Nobody can see the results. No one. They, they spent two days training recalls. Anyways, point being relationship, guys, when someone says things like I'll use my relationship, I always question it because if you can't do what I do, what kind of relationship do you have? Okay, let's see. So Teeny Evans says, Jamie Penrith. Yes, you're right. So Jamie Penrith is an e-collar advocate in the, um, in the UK. Uh, did a fantastic video on this study with livestock. He showed footage of it and the positive only dogs were a mess. I don't understand how they proved it. They didn't prove a thing, guys. Listen, this isn't hard. I'll challenge. Listen, anybody around here that you have a positive only training school, I'll put... $10,000 cash on the line. We'll go to a park, right? 
We'll all, we'll take a bunch of dogs. You'll train them your way. I'll train them my way. We'll go to a park, right? And maybe I'll give you two dogs. I'll take two. We'll start training at the same time. After four weeks, we'll go to a park. We'll take them off leash and we'll see whose dog comes, right? No, I'm not even going to tell you the park. We'll just go to a park. There's going to be people there. It's not going to be set up. It's not going to be fenced off. There's going to be people. There's going to be squirrels. There's going to be Canada geese. There's going to be everything there. And we'll just see whose dog comes, whose dog stays. We'll see. But you'll see no, no one ever will take that challenge because their relationship's so good, their dog doesn't listen to them. All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, is that dog you put on your Instagram the other day, Q Leo, for sale? No, he's not for sale. That puppy is a puppy I sold to one of my clients in, uh, I think she's in Utah. Just a fantastic looking dog. That dog is out of Vasco and Diva. Yeah, Brian Erickson, German Shepherd, almost three years old. We live in Sweden, no options to e collar or prong. Problems with dog reactivity, getting better and better, but lots of nervous, aggressive reactions. Thoughts? Yeah, use a slip lead um, and you can buy e collars. Like, look, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you you can do it without some kind of aversive training. I know in Sweden, aversive training is completely illegal, but. You know, you've got to be smart. They make e-collars nowadays. It looks like a flat collar, right? Feel free to use that. Like no one would know your dog is wearing it. Um, and then use a slip lead, you know. In Sweden, they even banned crates that have doors on them. They're insane over there, you know. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go back up, guys. Um... Oh, well, we got a super chat from Yogi Bear. What are your thoughts about present canario breed? I have chickens and sheep on my farm. However, coyotes attack my livestock at night. I need a dog that's agile, alert, with high pain tolerance. I have a Corso and a Dogo. Look, you got a Corso and a Dogo. You want to add a present to that mix? You enjoy blood sports? Like, these are not dogs that generally tolerate one another, right? Like, uh, I would assume your Corso and your Dogo, if they're not puppies, are opposite sex, you know? Same-sex aggression is very real in those breeds. Um, for me, for livestock issues, I buy a livestock guardian. I don't know why people always try to put the wrong dog in the wrong job. Can a Presa do it? Maybe. But I know a livestock guardian will do it. This is why they, they make dogs like the Kuvas. They make dogs like the, the Caucasian Shepherd. Um, you know, the Great Pyrenees. There's multiple dogs like that. The Kangal. Right, go get one that's that's strong and confident, and he'll do that. But watch out, your other dogs, he might not like them so much either, right? So keep that in mind. Maybe you buy a puppy, you raise them with them, and, and hopefully everything works out. Um, let's see here, guys. I'm just gonna go back up because I don't miss a whole bunch. Uh, Merry Christmas. You're in Canada. Did you get hit with the storm? Uh, it's funny. I joked I joked about the storm because I have a buddy in, in uh, Buffalo and he was going on about the storm, how bad it was. And I was sitting here and I'm like, you know, this, this blizzard is like a blizzard with uh, erectile dysfunction. There wasn't much for us here uh, where I was anyways. We didn't really get dumped on. Maybe like six inches of snow. Wasn't too bad. Uh, how old am I? I don't know if I should answer that question. <laughs> I'm old enough to be a daddy. And I'm old enough... Um, actually, I shouldn't probably say that. <laughs> I'm old enough to be a daddy. People call me daddy. Uh, let's see. Had a chat with someone the other day that has a Pressa ex Canacorso. Wouldn't cage him because relationship, but chopped his balls to stop him. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing. You know, they always talk about the relationship. And, but then they're always quick to cut the sexual organs off the dog on the promise that they may have some behavioral uh, benefits, right? I have never cut sexual, sexual organs off my dog hoping that I would get a behavioral change in them. I, I ne I've never had to do it because you don't actually have to name your dog in order to get them to behave. You just have to train them properly so it, so it turns out. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you know, in this world that we live in, it's so strange. You know, people think like that people have, I guess because we're so soft and emotional now, right? That, that we've, we've discarded logic. You know, uh, a relationship is based on trust and respect and, and, and 
those things imply that not only good things come from that relationship, but there are consequences for bad behavior that are very real. Like I, I respected my father, right? He was a very, he is a very good man. He was a very uh, kind man. You know, when I was a child, he was very, very nice to me. Um, you know, like I remember, I have very fond memories. Um, but when I was older and I was a shithead, he applied the necessary level of discipline. Um, frankly, he probably should have done a little more than what he did, to be honest with you. He's a little bit soft-hearted. But I surely didn't hate him for it. I loved him. And, and you know, I got a four-year-old right now. You can probably hear him screaming in the background. <laughs> I've disciplined him. He doesn't love me any less. Uh, and physically disciplined him, in case you were wondering. I had a period in my life where my dog was always with me in all situations. Yeah, that's always the best way. Uh, listen, positive only, you know positive only trainers? No, I probably shouldn't say that. Positive only trainers though, like especially the guys, they're kind of weird, aren't they? Just saying, if it looks like a, it must be a. I'll let you fill in the blanks. But they are all kind of weird. Like you wouldn't, uh, I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> like you wouldn't want to leave your kids alone in a room with them weird. You know what I mean? Not saying, I'm just saying, kind of weird. Um, all right, let's see what else we got going on here. Wish I'd gone for the off-leash course instead of the power obedience. Well, power obedience is competition training, right? Um, that's that's the difference. Like, I do the tricky stuff. I, I, I do the competition work, but the competition work has nothing to do with functional. I separate the two very well, which, unfortunately, positive trainers and, and sometimes other trainers that should know better will try and sell you the sport stuff as, like, functional stuff. You'll notice that my dog with me in the sport, when I'm when I'm on the field with him, he's super focused on me. He's prancing. He's really active. When I walk and you see me when I'm hiking with him, he's just walking with his head down. He's walking like a normal dog. He's not adrenalized. He's not always in this expectation of a reward. That's not normal, right? Like, that's not realistic. Yeah, I know the positive trainer when he holds the hot dog above his border collie like this. The border collie is going to focus heel staring at him. But that's not real life. Who, who wants to walk down the road like that? Plus, the dog's going to lose interest in about five minutes anyways, right? You need to constantly be jackpotting the reward to keep that dog engaged with you. And if you have a, a very, like, motivated dog, like a Border Collie or a Malwa, sure, they'll be able to do it to some degree, but that's not a relaxing way to walk. I need to be able to drink my coffee, to text, to enjoy nature. My dogs are with me. My dogs are, are, are not, I'm not with them. They're with me, right? Let's see here. Um, which IGP trainer has trained dogs for IGP ring sport or canine? Um, there are some, um, but none of them have achieved high levels with their dog, regardless of what they claim. The ones that everybody recommends, it's funny, you know, like, oh, go train with this girl or that. It's like, I know a very famous, I know of a very well known positive only trainer that everyone's constantly recommending. Um, you know, to take their online course and stuff. And this person, you know, gave up their dog. They had like a young dog, very like easy dog, like very like fluffy, happy, easy dog. They gave up the dog because the dog was redirecting on them to somebody that um, I know online. Um, and he does the sport now with that dog. And that dog is like not a super powerful dog. It's just like a nice, normal dog. This person who everybody's, oh, go train with this person. Go do this person's course. It's like... You couldn't handle a happy, fluffy, go lucky, easy dog that I give to like my most junior trainer. You know, oh, he's redirecting. Well, you're the super positive only trainer. You should know what to do with the redirection, right? Of course, it doesn't work. The system doesn't work. That's why you give up on dogs that are perfectly normal and easy like that. And it's creating this push for more and more border collie type dogs, but in more like serious. Listen, there's a place for compliant dogs. There's a reason why shepherds bred border collies to be like the way that they are, where a, a strong word is enough because it makes it easy to control the dog at a distance. And obviously they pre-selected for that as they were breeding these dogs because what good is a dog that's super independent and strong and, and, and has its own mind? But in other breeds, like breeds where you're doing real work, like man work or, 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 or um, you know, guardian work, 
You need dogs that are more independent, dogs that are more strong, dogs that are more resilient. And that usually means dogs that are less compliant. People don't understand that. They think they can have the best of both worlds. I have a genetically fearful dog. I agree. However, I got the pup knowing that there would be genetic issues and follows your video. I'd worked with my trainers from nine weeks old. And I can agree. Yeah, that's how it goes. You know, genetic fear is no joke. Hillary, Merry Christmas. We'll have to watch. We'll have to watch later as I'm at work today. Awesome topic. Be clear, be consistent, be fun. Yeah, Hillary, you do a fantastic job. I see all your videos. I know you're you're getting after it with your with, Hillary has a puppy from us and she's doing IGP. She's doing functional work with her dog. Um, she's a, she's she's really getting after it. So she's living she's living the the walk, so to speak. She's not just talking the talk. Negative consequences are the only thing allowing my husky to be off leash. Learned everything positive. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with, listen, I use tons of positive training with my dogs. You know, I love it when I have a dog that has high food drive or high toy drive. It just expedites the training process. I want you to think, the best way to think about training when you're using any kind of aversives or consequences, think about a car that needs to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. And training should be fast. Good training sh does not take years and years. Your dog's only living, on average, 12 years. What do you mean it takes years and years? You should, it's not ethical to leave a dog hanging in the gray area for, for years and years because you have some ideological, you know, position and you want to feel good about yourself and leave the dog hanging out to dry. But when you think about a car that needs to get from point A to point B and think about it as it's in like this vast parking lot and he's not sure, you're not sure as the driver how to get from point A to point B. When you introduce negative reinforcement and in some cases positive punishment, Think of it as now there's two cement barriers on either side of the car running from point A to point B. And now all the car has to do now is just hit the gas and get from point A to point B. That's, a, that's what training looks like when you have a full system, right? When you have a proper balance system. Not where you're like, oh, like, should I turn left? Should I turn right? Should I stop here? Should I go here? It's very clear. This is the starting point. That is the destination. Get there. Okay. I just watched that video with the pocket bully, first functional, healthy. Yeah, we have a video with, with, we have several bully videos, I think. I mean, our training system works with every dog because it's a complete training system. The bullies aren't easy to train because they tend to be a combination of stubborn and sensitive. <laughs> so they're not the easiest dogs to train. And then they get really intense when they get aroused by something like another dog or, or their prey kicks in or something like that. But you can get them there. You could certainly get them there. They tend to take a little longer than your average lab, though. To be frank, animal behavior... <laughs> Sorry, guys. The kids are getting after it. Uh, to be frank, animal behavior is probably the least rigorous field there is that's still considered science. You're right. It's, it's a bunch of junk. Listen, it seems like the curse of every generation of human beings is to assume they know everything. And we're no different when it comes to our medical science... Our science of nutrition, how the world works, animal behavior, everything. We assume we know everything, right? That's a bad assumption. And just like every other generation, they're probably going to look back on us in 100 years and be like, what the hell was wrong with those guys? They were crazy. Let's see here. How's your Dutchie been doing? He's doing great. The biggest thing with the Dutchie is carving a new neural pathway, right? So the problem with dogs that are older... Um, problem with dogs that are older, especially dogs like the Dachi, very intense dog. He's used to getting what he wants. You know, um, he's, he, he, he's, he's used to being restrained, but he's not used to controlling himself. So when you put him in a situation where the arousal level goes up, like he sees a decoy and he wants to bite the decoy. And now you say, okay, now you must control yourself. Well, the neural pathway that he has is one of restraint. They just held him back. And then when it was convenient, they would let him go and he would go bite. He never had to hold himself back. So now when you say to him, now you must hold yourself back and you must put pressure on him, of course, in order to accomplish this. Now that's where the conflict comes. And when the conflict comes, sometimes you get the handler aggression. So you, this is where it becomes, I need to carve this neural pathway that doesn't exist in his big, big head that you hold yourself back. You wait for my go ahead. And that's what we're working on now. And it takes a lot to... to yeah, the dog's three years old. I've had him for two months, right? 
Uh, Matt did a super chat. Always appreciate it. Has my dog has been on a resi in the UK for reactivity and e collar? She is at a good level off leash. Do you think your off lead course would be beneficial? Really want to try to think she could get better. Well, look, man, I always say this. If your dog will come reliably to you off leash, if your dog will walk next to you reliably off leash under distractions, hold a sit, hold it down, and have all the other basic things you need, then you don't need my off leash course. If your dog won't do those things, then you probably need my off leash course. Um, Dylan Ryan, I brought, I brought my nine month old herder to a PSA trainer. And when they walked in just to meet the pup, the pup barked at him. I said no and gave her a small leash pop. He said, I shouldn't be correcting her for that. Um, it would depend on the situation and how fearful the dog is. Uh, I will tell you that um, I'm not one of those people that believes you shouldn't correct a sport dog. If your dog can't handle being corrected for inappropriate reactive behavior um, and simultaneously do the sport, then your dog is not made to do the sport anyways. So you've lost nothing by doing that other than fixing a, a negative behavior. Hey, has my dog seems to always be in that adrenaline mode? Well, you need to dial down the uh, reinforcement uh, positive. If, if you're doing a lot of that and your dog's like hyper, uh, hyper aroused for like the reward or the ball. Um, but usually what I find when people tell me that is, Matt, that what, what their dog really is, is your dog's hyper aroused by the environment. And he's in a high state of adrenaline because he's always expecting to interact with the environment and self-satisfy with the environment. So I'll quickly disabuse him of that notion um, and and, sh and show him over uh, multiple repetitions that there's no self-satisfaction in the environment, all the satisfaction's with me, and uh, I'll put his butt to work and, and, and get him going. Uh, let's see here. A lot of positive comments, guys. I'm not gonna read them all just because of time here. What do you think about training a pit bull? They're not the easier dogs to train because again, they're a combination between sensitive and um, um, more more difficult with the pressure because they get aroused very easily. So when they get aroused, their sensitivity level drops precipitously. And um, if you're going to try to use the same level of pressure that you used on them when they weren't aroused, it's it, they're not going to feel it or perceive it. And then when you dial it up, oftentimes they'll overreact. So that's the challenge when you're dealing with the pit bulls. They're not like the most easy dogs to train. They're not the most difficult. Uh, let's see. If you had to choose one of my online courses, which one would you recommend to a young trainer? Elite off leash. I wish my elite off leash course existed when I was becoming a dog trainer. Like if that had existed, I would be... You guys are basically... When you train with somebody and you and they're honest with you about what they do, you're getting access to all the mistakes that they made. You're getting access to all the experience they accrued. You're getting access to the lessons they learned from thousands of hours on the leash. So as a trainer or a handler, that's why I like to go and train with people that I consider to be accomplished. I'm getting a head start. They've already been through things I haven't been through. They've already dealt with something I haven't dealt with. They've already seen that. They've been down that road. They know where it goes, right? My training system is no different. When you train with me, you're getting access to all of that. How do you properly vet people when selling the dog? I mean, it would depend on the dog and how difficult it is. You know, I find a lot of people getting rid of their dog. In many cases, the dog has all sorts of problems and then they want to be all picky about where the dog goes. It's like, bro, your dog... You should be happy that anyone wants to take your dog. I'm not saying that's your situation. I'm saying that's what I often find. Um, you know, it's funny because it's like nowadays when you deal with rescues, like they go overboard. They make everything so difficult. And people, the only reason I feel like people adopt from rescues these days is because they want that like, um, what's the word? Like those ego points like, oh, he's a rescue and we adopted him and we saved him and blah, blah, blah. But like. I'm looking for a cat. I want a cat for my kennel because I need a, a cat to desensitize. I'm getting more and more dogs that have problems with the cat. So I need a I need a cat or three in my kennel that I can desensitize and train around cats. So I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm paying for a cat. But if you go to a rescue, it's like you're adopting a child. It's a freaking cat, man. They're free. 
So instead, I'm going to go online and I'm going to pay someone like 50 bucks or get it for free. I'm going to go get that cat and put it in my kennel. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where it's like if, you, if you're trying to get rid of a problem, you have no right to make things difficult for people. You know, um, if it's a good dog, then by all means, you know, take all the time you need to take. But there's no magic way to vet people. You know, a lot of breeders, they make people fill out these like long elaborate forms and sign these. You'll know I do not actually really care about contracts. I don't make people sign anything. I'll tell you this. I don't generally, it's very rare for me as a breeder to have had any problems with people I've sold dogs to. Very, very rare. The only time I've ever had a problem is when I sell a cheap dog. When I have a dog, maybe I sold a dog a couple years ago to some idiot. And at the time I thought she was a nice lady. But the ears didn't stand on the dog. And he didn't have the drive for protection work. So I sold him for like, I don't know, a thousand bucks. And then a year later, this idiot accuses me of training the dog for protection. And that's why the dog decided to nip her kid or some nonsense like this. Not the fact that she had the dog for a year and, you know, did whatever she did to not fix the problem. Nor did she take up my offer to, to come and train with the dog. Right? This is an example because it was a cheap dog. Most of my dogs are not cheap. My dogs are very, very expensive. And I find that that tends to weed out the vast majority of people that are, are time wasters and people that aren't going to look after the dog properly. Uh, you can't afford him? Well, in that case, yeah, if he's very well trained, take a nice video of the dog showing all the things that he can do. If he's good looking, that'll surely help. Um, and uh, post it up and you'll probably get some good money for the dog. When people are willing to pay for, for value, you know, people are willing to pay for something when it's nice. If you've got a big, strong, beautiful looking dog that's obedient, people will pay thousands of dollars for this dog. I couldn't continue training my dog on my own, so I got a trainer here. He just got back and he was, t and I was told to continue training. I was told he would be 100% trained when he came home. It's not the case. It depends. It depends. Um, so like in the case of, I mean, it would depend what they sold you. You know how many times people want to send me a dog for two weeks and then they want me to fix all his behavioral problems and fully train him off leash and I say, no way, right? Like minimum for this dog is like four or five weeks of training. Training never is over. There's no such thing as 100% trained. There's mostly trained, all the hard work's done and all you need to do is do these small things to maintain the work and occasionally correct the dog if he's wrong and occasionally reward the dog when he's right. And then there's... We've done a lot of the groundwork, but you still have to finish the dog. And then there's, we did nothing but fuck around for however many weeks we had your dog. And uh, here's your bill and here's your dog back and good luck. And if, you, if it's not working out, it's because you, you're doing it wrong. So it could be any one of those three or four things. <laughs> Some funny stuff in the comments, guys. What is the best dog for someone that is a couch potato? Um, I wouldn't say that it's a specific type of dog. You know, I trained a wolfhound recently and he was just so chill. He just lay around all the time. I think, uh, uh, I've trained a bunch of Great Danes. They tend to be more couch potatoes. Funny, the bigger the dog, it seems the more relaxed they are. The Mastiffs tend to be pretty sleepy, like the Bull Mastiffs and the Boar Bulls and stuff like that. My dog was there for seven weeks. Okay, so he should be pretty damn finished. He should be pretty push button, um, and you should have to not do too much to get him to listen. So, yeah, Diane, maybe you got taken to the cleaners. I don't know. Uh, my goal is to have a personal protection dog, so my eight month old German Shepherd barks and growls when people touch me. When or should I correct him? Yeah, you should certainly correct him. Reactive behavior that's inappropriate is never a good thing. That's never an appropriate behavior. That's not, a, that doesn't equate to protection. That equates, equates to an out of control dog um, that's acting without your guidance. That's not okay. My, one of my babies just crying in the background and making sure you guys don't hear me. Can you briefly explain Bart Bellon's force fetch? I saw him doing some bite box work with a dog biting his finger. Um, I mean, it's, it's based on, like, he's actually not the first guy I've seen do that. I saw another guy that, I think it was Michael Ellis, he would put his, no, it wasn't Michael Ellis, it was somebody else. He would put his whole hand in the dog's mouth and make them hold the hand. And the idea is that they don't hold it too tight, obviously, because it would hurt a lot. And then they don't chew, but then they don't hold it too loose. Um, you know, I don't see the need for it. You can do force fetch. I usually do force fetch on a dowel. 
um, a plastic dowel that's slippery so that the dog has to hold it. And also, if the dog happens to bite too hard, you know, I'm not going to lose a digit. Um, but Bart Bellon's a very, uh, obviously, he's a very clever dog trainer. He's a very effective dog trainer. And, uh, you know, everybody's learned something from him. So uh, I, I don't use my finger. Um, but, I mean, he does. I, I've trained a lot of, I've trained with a lot of people that have really nice retrieves in competition and they don't use their finger. But again, there's a reason for everything, right? Uh, all right. Okay, guys, we've had a good life. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. My hooligans in the background are getting ready for lunch and uh, it's been good. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. I appreciate all the super chats. And, um, you know, I'll check in with you guys later, probably do an Instagram live, not too, I don't know when, um, but I'll probably do an Instagram live later on. Okay. And remember guys, stay balanced in your training. You got to do everything. You got to do the positive. You got to do the negative. You got to do everything. And it's got to be at the right time with the right level of consistency. One of the worst things you can do is be inconsistent. That's what scares and stresses a dog out. Merry Christmas, everybody. And uh, happy new year. If I don't see you before then. Oh, I should also mention, check out our online training.